This is part two of our dizziness lecture. Uh, please refer to part one if you haven't already. As we keep on hammering in the critical differential mantra, for dizziness, there are certain things you can't miss. On the previous lecture, part one, we talked about syncope and presyncope. This lecture will focus on vertigo and disequilibrium. The initial part of your encounter should really focus on helping the patient decide or define what they mean by dizziness or lightheaded. You want to try this a few times. Ask them to describe what they feel without using the words dizzy or lightheadedness. First try in an open-ended manner, and if that doesn't work, then provide them with multiple choice options. Ultimately, patients break down into three categories. Patients that have clear-cut syncope or presyncope symptoms, patients that have clear-cut symptoms of vertigo or disequilibrium, and then you have a group where they give you a mixture of both syncope and vertigo. In this last group, it's important to try to determine which is more likely. Is this more of a syncope or is this more vertigo? Um, you may need to work up both entities simultaneously, but early on you should develop a feel for which one of the two is more likely so that you can help formulate a disposition decision. In this lecture, we'll focus on the approach to vertigo disequilibrium. The first branch point in the algorithm is determining if this vertigo disequilibrium is peripheral or central in origin. A peripheral issue is something going on with the vestibular system. It's an otologic uh, problem, uh, and it has nothing to do with what's going on inside the brain. Whereas the central issue refers to an issue with the brain, uh, either a stroke in the cerebellum or a posterior circulation stroke. Both of these can cause the sensation of vertigo or disequilibrium, but they do so in a very radically different way. Peripheral vertigo is characterized by the sudden onset of very intense, intermittent, extinguishable, and positional symptoms of dizziness or feeling like the room is spinning or if you're on a boat or if you were drunk. These patients are very sick and have a lot of nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis, and they can also have, exhibit horizontal nystagmus, um, specifically unidirectional horizontal nystagmus. Whereas central vertigo is defined by a slow onset or an ill-defined sensation of dizziness, uh, room spinning, or feeling like you're drunk, the sensation is constant, doesn't ever extinguish, uh, doesn't really change with position. Uh, the patients actually look pretty well and have no or minimal nausea and vomiting. And the nystagmus can be vertical, it could be bidirectional horizontal nystagmus, just anything other than unidirectional horizontal nystagmus. And finally, the other differentiator between these two is what the neurologic exam shows. In peripheral vertigo, you'll have a normal neurologic exam Whereas in central vertigo, you might see some neurologic abnormalities, either in the form of cerebellar dysfunction or a cranial nerve defect. The other thing you want to make sure to check on all of your patients that present with vertigo is whether or not they have good truncal tone. What you're trying to determine is if the patient can hold themselves sitting up without using any support. So while they're in bed, you have them sit up and see if they can hold that position without lateralizing or falling. Patients with peripheral vertigo will have good truncal tone, whereas those with central or uh, cerebellar slash posterior circulation stroke will have bad truncal tone and have an uh, inability to hold themselves up. As you can see, this is a very long list and it can become a little confusing as to what is peripheral, what is central, especially if you try to memorize both at the same time. So what I tell my students is to memorize just one and to know that if it's not on this list, it belongs to the other one. I chose to memorize things on the peripheral list because it happens more commonly and I seem to refer to it more frequently but you could just as easily memorize everything on the central vertigo list. So your whole encounter is focusing on the history and the exam
to try to see if you can build a solid, airtight, slam dunk story for your patient having peripheral vertigo. Just as before, patients will self-select into one of three groups. Those that give you only peripheral symptoms, those that give you only central vertigo symptoms, and those that give you a combination of both. And this decision can be nerve-wracking because the management is radically different for both of these. Patients with a clear-cut peripheral vertigo syndrome get symptomatic treatment and are then discharged home, whereas those with central vertigo get an extensive stroke workup and are admitted to the hospital. And that's a big deal, big difference. In peripheral vertigo, I don't really need labs or imaging. It's all a clinical diagnosis. Whereas for central vertigo, I'm getting labs, I'm getting an MRI, I'm talking to my consultant, the neurologist. So why do we care about discharging patients with a stroke? You may have noticed that whenever you have a stroke admission, most of the workup centers around secondary prevention and physical therapy. Most of these patients do fine and nothing really happens. You just kind of sit there and watch them for the whole duration of their inpatient stay while they're getting all of their studies done. The reason this stroke is different is the location. When we talk about central vertigo, we're talking about a potential stroke in the cerebellum or the posterior circulation near the brainstem. The cranium is a confined space that can only house brain tissue, CSF, and blood. If you increase the volume of any one of those, you have to decrease the volume of the other one. And the body normally auto-regulates this if the increase in volume is gradual. But when the increase in volume is rapid, structures get pushed around. And what happens in a cerebellar or posterior circulation stroke is you have dead tissue leading to inflammation leading to edema. And this happens rather quickly. And this part of the brain cannot accommodate these rapid shifts in volume. And therefore, you have a potential for an uncle herniation because the, all the, the brain tissue gets pushed through the foramen magnum. And this process can happen in a matter of days. So if you have a person who showed up to your emergency room on day one of feeling vertiginous or having disequilibrium and it was central vertigo, then you sent them home, they might do okay for one or two days, but later they may develop altered mental status and potentially have an uncle herniation at home. So yeah, this is a high stakes game with a high stakes decision and your patient can die. And I'm not telling you this to scare you into getting an MRI and a neuro consult and a flog of labs on every patient that comes in with vertigo. I'm telling you this so that you can take and make your decision seriously. So when I approach these patients, I start at the default position of saying that I think this is central vertigo, and then I focus my whole encounter on trying to convince myself that it's not central vertigo. If at the end of the encounter I can't confidently convince myself that this patient has peripheral vertigo, then I stay on my default position that this is central vertigo and proceed to the extensive workup. However, if I have a patient who tells me very clearly that the symptoms were sudden, intense, intermittent. I can see that they're extinguishable. The patient is now asymptomatic. Uh, he reports a very clear positional component and that when he gets the symptoms, he's very nauseous to the point of vomiting, has a completely neural neuro exam and good truncal tone. I have now convinced myself that this patient has peripheral vertigo and I would not do an extensive work on that in that patient. In the process of working up your patient and making a decision uh, as to whether this is peripheral or vertigo, there is one test you can perform in the symptomatic patient to help you decide. That test is called the HINTS exam, which stands for Head Impulse Test, Nystagmus, and Test of Skew. This test is only helpful in the actively symptomatic patient. So please remember to only perform it if your patient is symptomatic and you're trying to determine is this more peripheral or is this, is this more central. If your patient has a HINTS exam that's suggestive of peripheral vertigo, 
then you know what to do and you go to treat them and discharge them home. Whereas if the patient has a HINTS exam that's suggestive of central vertigo, you now have an extra piece of data that you can use to help paint the appropriate picture for your consultant to help them understand um, that your patient uh, has a concerning presentation. Please refer to the show notes for specifics on how to perform these tests, but more importantly, you may want to do a search for videos on patient, uh, people performing these uh, specific tests so you can get a feel for what is a normal finding and what is an abnormal finding. It may be a lot easier to understand that way than just by reading alone. And that's how I approach dizziness uh, when the dizziness report is reported more like vertigo. Uh, please check out the part one version of our dizziness lecture if you want to take a look at how to approach um, patients with presyncope or syncope.